Okay, great. So good morning, everyone, and welcome along to this webinar to discuss the findings of new research supported by the Standard Life Foundation, which has been looking at how changes in hours worked have been impacted upon inequality and poverty in the UK. My name is Graham Roy and I'm Dean of External Engagement in the College of Social Sciences at the University of Glasgow and part of the project team. That team included Mark Mitchell and David Iser from the Fraser of Allen Institute and Robert Stewart from the Scottish Centre for Employment Research, all at the University of Strathclyde. Now you'll hear from Robert and David in a moment as they'll give you an overview of the research and the key findings. And after they've done that, we're delighted that we'll hear from two distinguished speakers to give us their reflections on the research findings. First of all, we'll hear from Rebecca Graham, who is Programme Manager with the Standard Life Foundation. And Rebecca is ideally suited to commenting on this work, having worked with a number of organisations, including the Money Advice Service, looking at various issues of inequalities in the UK. Secondly, we'll be joined by Rachel Statham, a Senior Research Fellow at IPPR Scotland. Rachel too has worked on a number of projects looking at inequalities over the years, uh, whether it be in the labour market, inclusive growth, and it will be huge in help, hugely informative to Rachel's thoughts to inform the discussion that we have. We'll then open up for questions, so hopefully you'll all be familiar now with how to ask a question on Zoom, so we'll be using the Q&A function, so please feel free to type in your question into that and you, I'll be able to pass them on to the team. Feel free to type in questions as we go, so you don't have to wait until the Q&A starts at the end. And then finally, can, just before we start, can I just express my thanks to the Standard Life Foundation for supporting this research and today's webinar. The Foundation is an independent charitable foundation with a particular focus on upon, upon improving financial well-being for people in low and middle incomes in the UK. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Rebecca and the team on this project. So a grateful thanks to the Foundation. And without further ado, let's make a start. In a short time, you'll hear from Robert, who will talk about the qualitative work that's been undertaken as part of this project and the findings from the interviews he's conducted uh, but first up, I'll hand over to David Iser, who will kick us off. Over to you, David. Uh, thanks, Graham. Okay, I'm going to uh, just try sharing uh, my screen. We've had a little glitch with this this morning, so let's see if it now um, does work. Ah, I think it has now finally worked. Can you see my um, slides? Yes, David. Yep. Great. Thanks. So. Um, as Graham was saying, um, this was some research that we started uh, about 18 months ago, actually. It was slightly knocked off course by um, COVID. But our starting point really was that what we wanted to do here was to think about how um, the hours that people work influence um, inequality and poverty. Um, I think we saw this as a bit of a gap in the, in the research. There's, there's clearly a lot of research out there about how uh, wages and housing costs and things like that influence inequality and poverty, but perhaps not so much on the question of uh, hours worked. And clearly, uh, you do see big variation in patterns of working hours between different groups in society. And that, as we'll talk about today, there have been some quite substantial uh, changes in some of those patterns over time. Um, so what we wanted to do is to sort of look at some of these changes, think about what was behind some of those changes and think about some of the implications for things like well-being and job satisfaction as well as incomes and therefore in inequality and poverty. So the way we did this, um, we've done a lot of uh, pretty in-depth analysis of some major UK-wide uh, employment surveys, including the Labour Force Survey and the Annual SAP Survey of Hours and Earnings, the Family Resources Survey. We've also, um, and, and Robert will talk about this later, we've also uh, spoken with employers and workers to get their take on the factors that influence uh, working hours and how those are changing. And throughout the report, what we've also done is, is um, looked at the extent to which some of these trends are reflected in comparator countries, uh, looking particularly at Germany, France, Sweden and the US. Uh, so that's the background and it's uh, research that we've done, the Fraser Valander Institute and the Scottish Centre for Employment Research, uh, as Graham said, funded by the Standard Life Foundation. Uh, so what's the big uh, picture? 
in terms of working hours? Well, actually, the big picture in terms of working hours is quite different for men and for women. So we'll often discuss uh, them separately in this presentation. Um, average hours worked by men have declined by about 6% between the late 1990s and 2009-10 sort of time. And that's actually quite uh, a rapid change in a fairly short space of time. And it, and it represents a sort of accelerated version of a trend that's actually been going on since the mid 19th century, which is for a decline in working hours um, on, on the whole. Now this decline in working hours is typically uh, explained in part by increases in real pay and living standards and what that does in terms of people's decisions about how much time to spend working versus doing non-work things. Uh, but changes to labour market regulations and institutions uh, have also been significant, particularly, I think, in this period from the late 1990s to uh, sort of financial crisis in 2009. What, what happened uh, in the late 1990s is introduction of working time regulation, uh, which limited working hours to 48 uh, per week. And if you look into this data in a bit more detail, you can see that this fall in average working time is uh, quite, quite substantially driven by a fall in the proportion of men working uh, more than 48 hours a week. So indicatively, that's, that suggests that the working time legislation uh, ha has uh, been part of that uh, story. Why then have, have hours worked stopped falling post the financial crisis? Well, I think the most uh, likely explanation there is the stagnation in real wage growth that we saw after the financial crisis. And what that's meant is that people have uh, tried to work longer hours or, or at least have no longer wanted to work shorter hours to offset those falling real wages uh, and perhaps to signal commitment to uh, employers. Uh, female hours worked, as I say, they've been on quite a different trend. There's been a long term upward uh, trend in average hours worked uh, by um, women. It was pretty slow, to be honest, up until 2009-10 and has accelerated a bit since then. And I think the explanations for that are similar to those that I was talking about for men. So the sort of stagnation in, in real pay um, has sort of um, increased this this trends towards increased working hours. Uh, there are other things too, of course, in the longer term picture, um, the sort of combination of changing social norms, um, improvements in childcare provision uh, and shift in uh, the, the uh, sectoral mix of the economy have also contributed to this uh, trend. Of course, you can you can cut this analysis in all kinds of different ways. Um, and if you're interested in, for example, how these trends differ by age group, uh, I don't have time to look at that in this presentation, but we've got information on that in the report. Um, and you might wonder, well, how does the UK compare on some of this and some of these trends? And in terms of men, uh, the story is that UK males do work relatively long hours compared to much of continental Europe or, or certainly the sorts of continental European countries we would think of as more direct comparators to the UK. And the reasons for that um, are historical and I think they're more to do with um, uh, the way that trade unions, the focus of trade unions and the way that labour market regulation, working time regulation has been implemented in those countries. It's not about the way that uh, uh, the labour market is taxed that causes those differences. So if you look back, it's quite interesting to, to make these historical comparisons. If you look back to the early 1970s, working hours among men were very similar uh, in the UK, Germany, France, US. But what happened in Germany and in France is that unions had a very big influence in the 70s and 80s on the concept of um, uh, work less, work all. There was a big emphasis on trying to drive uh, working time reduction and that was then followed through in terms of uh, stricter, if you like, uh, interpretation and implementation of working time legislation. Now if you look at uh, 
women who work full time, the story there is similar to that for men. So UK full time working women tend to work slightly longer hours than those in France, Germany and Sweden for similar um, reasons. It's a bit different if you look at um, all uh, women because actually the UK average is then pulled down by the fact that um, women in uh, in couples and particularly those with young children tend to work uh, shorter hours than uh, those in, in European comparative countries. And that seems to be around, partly around uh, provision of childcare, costs of childcare and the way in which tax credits have historically worked in the UK. So that's some big picture stuff. Um, what about the kind of questions that we're more particularly interested in, in terms of how do hours work affect inequality and poverty? What this chart is uh, looking at is what is the relationship between hourly pay and hours worked? So what we've done here is we've divided up um, all UK male employees into 10 deciles ranked according to uh, their hourly pay from the lowest paid 10% on the left uh, to the highest paid 10% on the right. And you can see that there's a, there's a fairly clear negative relationship there. Um, the highest paid males in 1994, this line shows, worked fewer hours on average than uh, the, the least well paid males. So this actually offset some of the um, inequality in hourly pay. These patterns of working hours actually offset some of the, 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 the pattern of inequality in hourly pay um, because the least well paid tended to work longer hours than the better paid. Something kind of interesting happened, which is that over the course of the period to 2009, hours worked fell much more significantly amongst the lower paid than the higher paid. Since 2009, that's not really changed a great deal. Um, this, this change in the pattern of hours worked among males actually accounts for four fifths of the rise in earnings inequality amongst men in this 15 year period. So it's quite substantial. And what are the explanations for that? Well, um, there are several things going on here. Um, one thing that actually we don't think is uh, significant here is a hypothesis that some other people have put forward, which is that this is all about rising female participation and that rising female participation has um, uh, led to this, this particular pattern of hours falling more quickly among low paid men than high paid men. We've looked at um, the evidence for that and we don't think that's a significant factor here. Some of the other factors that are probably more relevant, occupational change plays a bit of a role here, might, might explain about a fifth of this trend. So the idea that there's been a fall in occupations that typically em employed men to work relatively longer hours a week and a rise in the sort of uh, service sector uh, jobs that typically um, employ people to work slightly fewer hours a week. But another big factor is again likely to be around regulation and the implementation of working time regulation. If you look back at the late 1990s, uh, low paid men were more likely to work over 48 hours a week. So the, we would expect the working time regulation to have a disproportionate effect on, on low paid relative to high paid men. So that also seems to be uh, a contributing factor here. It's quite hard clearly to sort of say exactly what proportion of these of this trend is, is due to these different explanations. But um, uh, I think changes in working time legislation and in the way in which firms um, use overtime uh, are, are the most significant factors here. Here's the same chart uh, for women. You can see that the relationship between uh, pay and hours worked is very, very different for women. It's a, it's a fairly strong positive relationship and the shape of that hasn't really changed signif significantly over time. Uh, this sort of general increase in, in hours worked is seen across the distribution. There's been a slight narrowing of, of inequality uh, in the sense that um, the lowest paid women have tended to see their hours worked increase slightly more rapidly than the highest paid. Um, 
Now, of course, just because uh, a worker works, whatever it is, 35 hours a week or 40 hours a week, it doesn't mean necessarily that that um, those are the hours that they ideally would like to work. Um, and we have these concepts of underemployment and overemployment. Underemployment being where employees would like to work longer hours at their current rate of pay and overemployment being where uh, employees would like to work fewer hours, even if that means less pay. Um, in the UK in 2019, there were just over 2 million underemployed. There were actually almost 3 million overemployed, so a slightly higher rate of overemployment than underemployment. Um, but however you look at it, there are 5 million employees, or there were in 2019, 5 million employees, so getting on for a fifth. Uh, of all employees who were dissatisfied in some way with their hours of work. Um, our thesis is that uh, underemployment reflects dissatisfaction uh, with income uh, or the security of that income. And it's not surprising, therefore, that underemployment is highest amongst the low paid um, and the young, and it increased uh, significantly in the aftermath of the Great Recession, particularly amongst the lowest paid, reflecting, I think, the fact that the, the lowest paid had less of a buffer to fall back on. Um, and so when real wages were falling in the aftermath of the Great Recession, that was where you saw this big increase in the desire to work uh, longer hours. Um, Overemployment, of course, uh, is actually the flip side of that in the sense that it's much more likely to affect uh, the high paid and older workers and much, much more likely to be overemployed, i.e. likely to, to want to work fewer hours than they actually do. Um, and if you're interested in looking at how some of these trends play out in other countries, we've got some of that information in the report. Um, and uh, I guess the takeaway is uh, the UK is not the only country by any means that has uh, an issue with underemployment. In fact, the evidence suggests that uh, France and Sweden, Sweden have, have higher rates of underemployment uh, than the UK. Underemployment seems to be correlated with unemployment across countries, so, so low unemployment and low underemployment uh, go together. Uh, and I guess that's something about the way that a tight labour market i.e. low unemployment, uh, gives workers greater uh, power, greater ability to, to, to influence their working conditions, uh, including hours work, as well as keeping pay growth high, of course. Um, of course, it's not just hours that matter, but um, the regularity and the predictability of hours from week to week matters too. That matters for household income and it matters for job satisfaction and it, and it matters for measures of well-being. And there's been a lot of debate on that in the UK in recent years. And there's certainly a perception that um, insecurity of work, insecurity of hours is increasing over time. It's actually pretty hard to kind of test that hypothesis with the data. The data is not very good at allowing us to capture the extent to which hours vary from week to week, or indeed the extent to which workers feel insecure or anxious about that. Um, but one thing that is very clear is that this, these ideas of uh, unstable hours um, and anxiety and insecurity associated with that affect a substantial number of workers. So some uh, surveys, some data suggests that maybe as many as two fifths of UK employees do face um, unstable work schedules that they don't get very much notice about. How many of those workers feel insecure or anxious as a result? Well, different surveys tell you different things, but it's at least two million maybe as many as 6 million workers feel quite anxious about the uh, unpredictability of their patterns of working hours. One of the things we do in our report is we look at um, workers on zero hours contracts and we look at underemployment as a, as a sort of proxy for dissatisfaction with hours. Uh, now, clearly, workers on zero hours contracts are much more likely to be underemployed than those who are not on zero hours contracts. That's partly because people on zero hours contracts tend to 
be uh, lower paid and work fewer hours. But even if you control for that, if you control for the fact that workers on zero hours contracts um, uh, are uh, in lower paid work and work fewer hours a week, you still find that underemployment is significantly higher amongst those on zero hours contracts than amongst those who are not on zero hours contracts. And I guess this is another piece of evidence that supports this idea that uh, for people on zero hours contracts, it's the employer who is determining significantly the hours worked and the, the um, insecurity of that is, is manifesting itself in uh, a higher rate of underemployment for those workers. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Robert now, who's on that note is going to talk more about our uh, findings from speaking to employers and employees about some of those issues. And then I'll pick up towards the end to look at how hours worked affects incomes at a household level. OK, over to you, uh, Robert. Thanks, David. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'll cover the third aim of this project, and this was to give some insight into the factors influencing contract hours and hours worked from the perspective of sample of uh, employers and workers. So we had a number of issues here that we were interested in pursuing for employers. These were their approaches to balancing their own and workers' needs for flexibility and stability in contracts, and how they made decisions about what contracts they offer and what factors influence those. For workers, we were interested in those working in atypical or non-standard forms of uh, employment contracts, for example, part-time agency, short fixed term and zero hours, why people take on these contracts, their benefits and costs, why they want more working hours than they currently have, their constraints on hours and what they wanted in the labour market in the short term future. So we conducted a series of telephone or digital semi-structured debts with a small sample of eight employers from across a number of sectors that we already know from the literature are strongly associated with non-standard contract types, for example, hospitality. And we have a spread of large and SME employers, both uh, across uh, urban and rural uh, local labour markets in Scotland. And secondly, with a sample of 25 workers across, across a range of contract types, who all told us that we're looking for more working hours. And in this respect, uh, we have an underemployed worker sample. And by underemployed, I mean people who wanted more hours and not other definitions of uh, underemployment that touch on skill utilisation. Although these factors uh, were also at play with uh, some of our participants. And we achieved a work and worker sample that was reasonably balanced in terms of its main component parts, male, female, socioeconomic group, and across age ranges and household types. I'll only make one additional comment here, which relates to the impact of COVID-19 and the challenges this posed for the fieldwork, particularly in the area of recruitment. Very difficult to get employers interested uh, on board with uh, research in a pandemic. They were already dealing with uh, more pressing workforce issues, sector uncertainties, and restructuring some of their working practices, which leads me in, I think, into, I think, the broader issue. It's uh, some of the output of the results of this part of the work is shaped by and needs to be placed in the context of some of the unique labour market pressures of 2020 and early 21. So, for example, in our worker sample, we have a quarter of people made redundant from full-time permanent uh, jobs during early 2020, as well as people who had been or were furloughed over the course of the pandemic. So, COVID-19 pressures and circumstances provide the very ready setting for this part of the study. So, let's turn first to employers and what they told us drives their decisions on contract types, and we can look at the following. They offered, not surprisingly, because we targeted it that way, a range of contractual types. In some cases, in larger employers, the bulk of the staff were in full-time permanent contracts. And at the opposite end, we had smaller employers who largely offered uh, non-standard contracts. When we asked them about their views and rationale uh, around contracting, there was a noticeable range of opinions, uh, and those were starkest on the use of zero hours contracts, which attracted polar and oppositional views, both supportive and not. But across the board, 
non-standard contracts are rationalised on the basis of the varying demands uh, for business business services and offering flexibility for employees, i.e., varied employee working hours and, fa- and uh, shifts. Not a great surprise. Service sector employers offered varied shift, shift patterns that were geared to fluctuating demands in their services and needed staff to fill these slots. Flexibility was a big selling point for them. For employers, flexibility offered workers the chance to access hours that were more suitable for them. For example, you know, it's, it's, it's the obvious suspects, people with uh, domestic childcare and caring commitments and students in further and higher education. And as I just said, there were some contrasting views on zero hours contracts. Some told us they avoided these types for a variety of reasons, firstly because of their poor press and to avoid any reputational damage, uh, and secondly because of a perceived conflict with our stated organisational values and ethos. So for some employers who wanted to be seen as worker friendly and who took this to mean that they wanted to offer greater security, they avoided this contractual route. On the other hand, employers who use zero hours contracts told us they did so as a function of their varying service demands and flexibility, but also because they simply could not afford to run or operate the service at its present levels without reduced staff costs. From the interviews, it was clear, and this is reflected in some of the issues picked up in the wider literature, that there were a number of important influences on non-standard contracting. The first issue really concerns the business model being used, which shapes recruitment and workforce planning. And across the board, all of the employers we spoke to put a strong emphasis on having the right people with the right skills and attitude, irrespective of contract. And here, non-standard contracts were essential for businesses who used temporary, for example, replaceable workforces to service peak service demands and or because the business model is based on a minimal or uh, the less use of more costly longer hour permanent staff. Other important factors here are having voice mechanisms. All of the employers told us they listened to their staff and tried to accommodate demands for more hours where these arose. Uh, And finally, let's give some place uh, to the importance of local labour markets in shaping staff contracts. Anyone who's ever seen a spatial map of uh, underemployment using labour market survey data will be familiar with it as a strong feature in rural areas. And here we had uh, hospitality businesses who effectively brought in high or higher volumes of temporary summer labour to service demands that could not be made, met locally. Turning to workers. One of the interesting issues here, uh, I think, is whether uh, employer views on flexibility are mainly one-sided or whether this chimes with uh, workers' descriptions about the benefits of non-standard contracts. And flexibility, as it turns out, did have some legs for many of our uh, participants because it was identified as the main benefit of these types of contracts. Perhaps not surprising because it underlies some uh, well-travelled working pathways for some types and groups of respondents. So flexibilities were seen to be very strong in uh, females working part-time balancing domestic childcare and caring commitments or those living independently in single-parent households with dependent children. Strong in younger age groups and uh, further in higher education who were mainly living at home and also evident in mid-career respondents made redundant during the pandemic and those who, because of the pandemic, couldn't access their normal lines of work. So as well as providing income, non-standard contracts provide provide, uh, flexibility benefits. But there are, of course, as we know, other sides to this. uh, And we saw in the statistical analysis that non-standard employment may be more likely to expose workers to a greater degree of insecurity. And turning to the downsides, no, that's it. While flexibility may have been the main worker benefit, the main downside was their weaker employment security stroke stability, the uncertainty about what hours they may, be, they may be working short term, which feeds into concerns about levels of personal income and household income, wider household planning and making ends meet. So short-term agency worker expressed concern about where the next contract was coming from or whether, whether they would be kept on. Longer fixed-term contract workers were concerned about what was coming at the end of the contract. 
and of course zero hours workers were thinking about what hours would be coming the next week or the next month. It was also very evident uh, in the interviews that people's views on insecurity were more strongly expressed by those in older age groups with more financial commitments and dependencies. So younger participants could talk about insecurity very well, but without outlining tangible consequences beyond a general feeling of uncertainty and the ability to plan ahead. Conversely, older respondents took these issues much deeper and further and expressed worries about the potential impacts on uh, household planning and spend. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the contractual status of people, most felt they had uh, very little control over their working hours. And many also reported drops in their financial income over the course of the pandemic because of redundancy, because of furlough and social distancing measures at work, both of which uh, reduced their working hours. And we know uh, also that there's a wider debate with some forms of uh, non standard contracts. Uh, I'm thinking principally zero hours and accounts of financial hardship. However, none of our participants uh, reported levels of uh, individual or household difficulties, things like personal debt, missing utility bills or mortgage uh, repayments. And of course, here, uh, welfare was an important support for the household incomes of around a third of the respondents, supporting household and childcare costs. And while some could tell us about other people who worked on zero hours contracts who were experiencing financial hardship, it didn't apply to them at the time of the interview. Why? Uh, well, two important moderate, moderating influences perhaps explain this. The first I've already touched on is welfare, but the second is or seemed to be the presence of a partner in full time employment. For example, all of those who were made redundant during the pandemic highlighted this issue as their safety net, as did those working part time in households with dependent children. So these workers as a whole, I think, balance flexibility with insecurity and their concerns about income. We also said in our statistical analysis that for a significant proportion of people on standard, non-standard contracts, the benefits of increased flexibility may be outweighed by increased inconvenience and insecurity. Was it outweighed in our sample? Actually quite a difficult question to answer with a sample who already report dissatisfaction with the current level of working hours. But the balance uh, towards it was certainly clearest in older respondents with dependents and those who had experienced redundancy. So what did people want in the labour market and what did you think was stopping them getting it? You can move that on. Uh, okay, sorry. Got it. Well, many of the people we interviewed ultimately wanted full-time, stable and predictable employment patterns. Most spoke uh, of wanting more hours, not just in the context of wanting more money, but the context uh, of a desire for full time and more contractually secure permanent employment and more stable guaranteed hours. So what did they see as the main barriers to achieving that? Well, firstly, among the sample, there was some individual health issues in terms of people's capacity, but more obviously the domestic circumstances. And I'm here I'm referring to labour market returner groups with dependent children. And here we also touch on some obvious policy points in the wider literature on gendered working patterns and labour market returners. Uh, should should uh, be clear to note that in, certainly in our sample, these were all largely female respondents with a desire for more working hours as their dependencies diminished over time. There were also a number, number of other issues mentioned by people. Firstly, these concern the number of hours for employers made available. One issue raised by some employers uh, around the topic of flexibility concerned workers' opportunities to take up additional contract hours with other employers if they were short with them. However, this really says little about some of the real opportunities uh, available to people uh, to do it. For example, workers in rural areas felt there were little local opportunities available anyway beyond seasonal work. And there was a feeling of uh, many of those on zero hours contracts and minimum guaranteed hours contracts that these actually restricted their ability to take on work with other employers. Finally, let me throw in the feeling that because of the pandemic, that there were less full time jobs available in local labour markets. I don't know how many employers shrunk their normal recruitment activities during the pandemic, but there were, there are, and there are a number of reports of that. Out with that, however, for respondents living in more rural areas, there was a recognition that these markets offered less full time jobs anyway, irrespective of any COVID. 19 impacts on employer recruitment. So I think in a quick summary, 
we can say the following things. Employers offer the range of contracts, rationalised, known standard contracting on the basis of fluctuations in service demand and fl worker flexibility benefits. And workers largely you know, endorse that and uh, they support flexibility and benefits, but this clearly needs to be a balance against their desires for a full-time job in contractual security. While our participants possess all or some of the part-time and temporary contractual features associated with the heightened risk of in work poverty, factors such as household composition, particularly the presence of a working partner and welfare support helped offset financial concerns. And finally, we identified a number of labour market barriers, uh, which may usefully feed into wider policy issues on training, stroke retraining and skills. And hopefully I've kept time and I can now hand back uh, to David. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, so we're, we are running a bit behind. I'll try and um, uh, be as brief as I can on the last couple of uh, slides. Um, so up until now, uh, a lot of what uh, we've been talking about is uh, how hours work vary across individuals. Um, but it's important to think about how they vary across households too. Um, what this chart does uh, is it uh, breaks up all the households in the UK into the 10 deciles ranked by income. So we've got the poorest 10% of households on the left and the uh, highest income 10% of households on the right. And then the bars look at average hours worked by the main earner and any subsequent earners, if there are any in those households. And you can see there's actually a fairly strong uh, gradient uh, there between uh, in, in terms of the increase in average hours worked as you as you move across the distribution. Um, that, that, that gradient is actually quite a bit steeper in the UK than it is in, uh, in many other European countries. So you might conclude from that that hours worked um, are you know, very important in determining whereabouts in the income distribution a household sits. Um, there is a very big caveat to that though, which is that if you look underneath this, uh, the, underneath these averages, you see that there's a huge amount of variation in the hours worked um, by people in, in different households. So for example, lots of people in high income households actually working relatively fewer hours and a lot of people in uh, relatively poor households working really quite uh, long hours. And so uh, in actual fact, I think what this average, there's a risk here in looking too much at these averages and thinking that that means that hours worked are very strongly influential on where in the household income distribution uh, a household sits. And that's a bit of a mistake. Um, hours clearly do matter, um, but in fact, in many cases, working longer hours is not going to make a very substantial difference to household income and other factors like clearly hourly wage, but also the composition of the household are really quite important in determining where in the income distribution it sits. And it's certainly not the case that uh, working more hours uh, is, is often going to be a route out of poverty for those households who are, for workers who are in poverty. So in terms of uh, implications for poverty, uh, for policy, um, clearly I haven't talked about COVID very much at all. Robert did. Our, our report was conceived in a pre-COVID world and we wanted really to look at some of the longer term trends. Obviously, COVID has turned the labour market upside down. Um, but this report is, is not about looking at what's happened in the last 12 months in a lot of detail. There are some great reports that do that. And we're certainly not uh, in this report sort of getting the crystal ball out and thinking about the extent to which some of those trends in the last 12 months will, will persist even once uh, restrictions are removed. But what we've tried to do um, is uh, think about policy, implementing, in, policy implications um, that uh, are likely to apply in, in the post-COVID world. And I think there's a strong case for saying that many of the trends that have happened in the last 12 months uh, have sort of accelerated uh, some of the trends we've, we've been looking at over the last, over the previous uh, 20 years or so anyway. Um, so implications for policy, um, we, we, drew, we draw out quite a few in the report. 
um, and I'll try not to dwell too long on any of these just now, but I think there are uh, what you might call macroeconomic priorities. So there's a clear implication coming out of the, this on the need for policymakers to focus on getting productivity growth going, keeping unemployment low. Why? Because these are things that keep wage growth up and that and the additional uh, power that that gives uh, employees to uh, determine and control their um, uh, 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 working environment, including ours, is uh, really quite significant. But there are more direct uh, interventions that uh, policymakers should be and are uh, looking at and thinking about, particularly in terms of things that will improve workers' control over hours, picking up on that point that Robert um, was making. So uh, things here around um, more notice about changes in hours, uh, potentially compensation for last minute changes to schedules are all really important things that we should be looking at. Now, the disappointing thing here from a policy perspective is that uh, in 2019, the UK government said it was going to bring forward an employment bill to look at some of these things that kind of got uh, knocked off course by COVID and it doesn't yet seem to have uh, got back uh, onto the government's agenda. Uh, it doesn't appear in the latest Queen's speech, uh, which is certainly very disappointing. Um, there are things here around reinvigorating collective bargaining. I think one of the things when you look at what's happening and has happened in other countries, you're struck by the role that collective bargaining plays in determining working conditions in other European countries and the way in which the UK we do things on a very individualized basis. Um, and in fact, organizations like the OECD are strongly behind this idea as well. But of course, it's one of those things it's much easier to say uh, sitting here than it is to do in practice, getting that infrastructure uh, and, and those um, uh, working practices embedded is going to be really quite challenging. But I think we would support the arguments that have been made by various others, including people like the Resolution Foundation, that you know there's a case here for at least experimenting in some of the sectors where uh, it's likely to be most possible and the benefits are likely to be greatest, like in social care, for example. We've got some recommendations in there about um, the safety net. That might seem a funny thing to have in a presentation about working hours. But what comes out quite clearly in the report is that insecurity isn't just about the job. It's about workers' uh, uh, awareness of what might happen if they were to lose their job or if their hours and income were to change. Um, and that's where the UK safety net uh, is really a bit weak in comparison to uh, many European comparators. Um, and finally, I mean, there's a, there's a final point here, which is really about uh, the fact that, you know, there's quite a bit of research out there that says, well, um, when governments do things like increase the minimum wage, uh, that's all very well, but we can link that quite clearly with accelerated use of things like zero hours contracts. And that's one of the ways that employers respond to increases in the minimum wage. So there's two um, interpretations of that. One is to say, well, governments should be very wary about increasing the minimum wage. But the other response, which I think is uh, uh, a more sensible response, is to say, well, we need to be conscious of those sorts of responses and decisions. And that is exactly why we need more emphasis on setting uh, flaws and conditions in relation to working hours and working practices so that we don't undermine or some of those um, potential uh, side effects, if you like, of uh, focus on low pay. Uh, so that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of some of the things in the report. Um, I guess the takeaway is that um, hours really do matter. They matter for well-being and they matter for incomes and therefore inequality and poverty. And um, we shouldn't forget about those things when we are thinking about uh, labor market policy and social policy more generally. Um, so our report's gonna be available on the Fraser Valner Institute website later this afternoon. Um, we certainly haven't answered all of the questions in relation to how hours affect inequality and poverty. Um, and perhaps we've, we've posed as many new questions as we've, we've answered. Um, 
Uh, but with that, I will hand back to Graham. Great. Um, thank you very much, David. So, um, yeah, so a good overview of the, the report and uh, hopefully we've uh, started to kick off some questions that people will come as we go through it. But before we get to that, uh, as I mentioned, I'm delighted to, to get to uh, welcome Rebecca and Rachel to get their reflections on the findings so far. So, Rebecca, if I could come to you first and then uh, we'll get Rachel next. Rebe Rebecca, over to you. That's great. Thanks very much, Graham. And uh, thank you also, of course, to Robert and David for that excellent run through of the work so far. Um, there's an awful lot in there, so I'll dive in with some of my reflections. Uh, I think one of the things that simply stood out to me from the report and from the findings was that underemployment has risen even where the number of hours worked has remained unchanged. Um, and of course, while not all of those people who are underemployed, who are looking for more hours of work, um, are in poverty, this picture does seem to tie in with all of the figures from recent years we've outlined, indicating the rise in in-work poverty, which is something that I'm sure we're all very concerned about. Um, similarly, the finding that amongst lone parents who are in employment, those who are living in poverty working the same number of hours on average as those who are not in poverty. And again, when we look at the European comparative data, it seems that uh, in the UK, it's less likely that you can live above the poverty line in anything less than full time working hours. So essentially, I'm getting a picture that for many, hourly pay simply isn't enough and the welfare benefits received aren't enough. And this is something that needs serious action. And uh, I think perhaps Rachel will talk a bit more about that when we get to her. Um, a point on uneven and unpaid workloads. Uh, given the uh, huge amount of research that has emerged in light of the pandemic, it really struck me that the halt in decline in working hours for men and the, the increase in working hours for women uh, could have serious implications for things like childcare. And um, as David mentioned, you know, improvements in childcare provision are, are mentioned as a possible reason behind some of these trends. Uh, I think uh, in some individual cases, people would, would certainly question this, given, the, uh, given uh, for example, the costs associated with childcare. And um, of course, the picture will have changed given the massive disruption to the childcare sector in light of the pandemic. Um, Looking at the, the big picture that David mentions, the, the number of paid hours worked by men and women seems to have been gradually coming closer together. Um, but there can still, of course, be a gap in other areas of work, um, unpaid work. Uh, there's a piece of research from a consortium, including Engender Scotland and the UK Women's Budget Group, um, which has shown that the unequal impact of unpaid workloads, so things like caring, housekeeping and so on, uh, have perhaps been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and mothers were more likely than fathers to have lost working hours or lost jobs as a result of the increased childcare responsibilities they faced during the pandemic. That particular piece of research also showed that mental health impacts of the pandemic seem to be greater for mothers than for fathers. Um, we don't know the exact cause of that particular finding, um, but putting all of this together, it does seem to really emphasise just how important it will be to develop policy that's effective for childcare, uh, for flexibility in the workforce, and for men as well as for women, if we're to, con to continue bringing these together. I think the, the underemployment figures that the report discusses are, are of concern, um, particularly in light of the continuing unknowns um, in the post-pandemic workforce. Uh, of course, we've seen that the implications of underemployment are not just financial. Um, so it's something that really needs addressing. Um, the report showed that the, the underemployment rates are slightly higher, again, for women than for men. And in, a, in another piece of work funded by Standard Life Foundation, the single parent charity Gingerbread made recommendations uh, regarding the need for greater flexibility in the workforce for single parents. And they highlighted a case where jobs were being advertised as part-time roles. Um, but in fact, on, on Delving Deeper, they had attached to them training periods required for the role. And these training periods are only, only available as uh, on a full. So they're actually completely unsuitable for the, precisely the sorts of people that the jobs are being advertised for. 
and situations such as this that can lead to people taking jobs that just aren't appropriate for them, whether that's in terms of their experience, their qualifications, or their desired hours that they work, um, have got to be really carefully looked at and people shouldn't have to resort to contract types that make their work feel precarious either. So I think, you know, the, the focus on getting people back into work is of course a must, but there must also be more than that. The types of work available have got to be better than they were before. Um, I think this is the sort of situation that perhaps some of the, the interviews that Robert was discussing were highlighting. I found the point about the, uh, the four day working week concept really interesting. I think it, it does come with a certain degree of challenge. Uh, you know, will it mean people doing the same amount of work for less pay? That's always a worry. Um, I do note the point about the four day working week um, sort of phrase being used as a shorthand for a 30 hour working week as opposed to something longer like a 37 or perhaps a 35 hour working week. Um, though I'm sure we all know of cases or perhaps have even been in a situation ourselves where part time working is really the exact same workload, but crammed into fewer, um, sometimes more stressful and often much, much longer days. Um, so as David was talking about the end there, uh, you know, work, workplace controls and so on, it, it really does require strengthening of controls and monitoring in the workplace. And I think this is something that it might be quite difficult for legislation around this to be put into meaningful practice. Um, the recommendations also made a very good point about the need for sectors like social care to be properly funded, which I'm sure is something we would all agree with. Um, again here, I think it's not just the money, a conditions floor is going to be very important here um, to make sure, for example, that workers aren't just being paid for time spent with care recipients um, whilst essentially funding their own travel and so on. Uh, we know that this can be a particular problem in rural and remote regions, but it does apply everywhere. Um, I realise we've talked about some of the concerns and things that have emerged from the report, but I think it's important to talk about some of the positives as well, um, such that, uh, you know, uh, the improvements in work-life balance that seem to have taken place uh, from the reduction in men's working hours. And I think we really need to try and use this perhaps slightly perverse opportunity of the pandemic to keep making improvements, but keep making them for everyone. Um, overall, I'd say the, the piece of research has been really useful for me in emphasising that um, perhaps simple but crucial point that inequality in weekly earnings isn't just influenced by hourly pay or the number of hours worked, but by the correlation between those two. Um, but given this, I wondered if perhaps we should have less of a focus in our sort of research and policy discussions on hourly pay, and perhaps we should be talking more about weekly or, or monthly pay or something that is more likely to take into account number of hours worked or the um, uh, you know, the fluctuation in hours worked. Um, so the, I guess there's a bit of a challenge there in terms of what statistics we should really be focusing on, uh, perhaps especially for those of us who aren't deeply immersed in all of the data uh, day to day. Um, and which areas of employment related policy do we think would be most likely to gain traction for change uh, if we ever do get to see an employment bill? Um, and where, what, what particular areas would you like to see more work focused on? Um, I appreciate, of course, these will be questions that lots of the people here will be very, very much occupied with already. So very interested to hear further comments and questions. I think there's an awful lot more that we can say, but in light of time, I will leave it there and hand back to Graham. But thank you very much for all of the work. Great, thank you, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, lots of stuff that we can pick up on um, later on. Uh, Rachel, over to you for your reflections. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, I'm conscious of time, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so I want to just reflect on um, the kind of wider policy implications I know we've touched on um, from the research. And I should start obviously by saying, um, I think it's really excellent and informative piece of research, um, both uh, for policymakers in Scotland, just as I know that that's where most of us are sat, um, having this conversation, obviously at the UK level as well. Um, and I suppose one of the major thoughts I had kind of reading through the report's main findings um, is this kind of longer term shift we've seen um, where for low income households, we used to have a challenge of kind of overly long working hours um, and through, you know, across the, I suppose the, the kind of international picture shows us that worker organising, you know, reductions in kind of standard working uh, working weeks um, have begun to uh, to kind of uh, mitigate that problem. And now we have a new, you know, a kind of new or a newly exacerbated challenge, at least from too few working hours um, concentrated 
in uh, low earning households. Um, and I absolutely agree with the assessment that that means that we need to be having a new type of conversation about how we measure um, not just uh, you know pay in terms of uh, hourly earnings rates, um, but how we uh, look across uh, you know kind of a financial security picture that looks at hours, looks at pay, um, and also potentially looks at the kind of costs incurred through uh, through work, you know, or relating to work, whether that's childcare, transport, um, or kind of wider set of cost factors. Um, but we have, uh, I think, a new kind of financial or a kind of a wider security deficit that um, I think is a really important challenge uh, when we're thinking about the UK labour market, uh, you know, that relates to the rise of low pay, to the rise of the work poverty that, that we've uh, discussed already. And um, but also that kind of wider and kind of, you know, potentially more, ne more nebulous, but really important economic insecurity uh, that means that too many people who are in work uh, and trying to get on in work, um, you know, are going without the basics and need to, you know, to have a to have a good life, to have a decent standard of living. Um, and there's obviously a wide range of social, you know, kind of societal implications that come from that as well, particularly when we're thinking about questions of poverty and inequality. Um, I thought I'd touch briefly on, on the Scottish uh, context, the policy context, in terms of how um, policymakers here have been trying to respond to some of these challenges. And I suppose we've seen uh, on kind of one end of the um, of the labour market spectrum, um, we've seen uh, the fair work agenda over the, the course of the last parliament, um, a focus on security alongside respect, voice, uh, opportunity fulfilment, um, you know, new questions about public sector procurement and how it can kind of push up uh, standards of employment. Um, and that conversation has been very focused on the real living wage, particularly. Um, but I think uh, this work, uh, you know, and other work across Scotland has shown um, the need to kind of have an expanded conversation going into that next term about uh, about how to push on a, an agenda that, that, you know, delivers, make sure that work delivers financial security for more families in Scotland. Um, but we also have uh, kind of new, uh, new horizons in terms of um, uh, talk of uh, a well-being economy, those ambitions that the Scottish Government has begun to lay out, um, and shorter working time apparently being part of that picture, being kind of framed as, as something that uh, is a kind of clear uh, well-being economy agenda and that brings together, you know, a kind of labour market shift um, and, you know, and policy changes that could really support greater well-being. Um, although I think as we've already touched upon, there's really major challenges about how we might get there, uh, what that looks like in practice. Um, so far we've seen, you know, support announced for kind of workplace trials, um, but on a fairly small scale um, and there's lots of challenges uh, that we can discuss hopefully um, about, uh, about how we actually begin to see that in practice and then also who might benefit from it. Um, so if we're thinking about that we probably need to be thinking about changing employer behaviour. We've begun to think about things like floors and working conditions through this conversation and um, so both hours earnings and that broader security particularly around kind of uh, patterns of working time. Uh, I think David picked up on a, on a stat I was going to mention um, from uh, the Living Wage Foundation that found that I think two-fifths of workers surveyed in the UK um, uh, regularly had a kind of minimum notice period of two weeks or less of when they were going to work. You know, and if you think about um, that disruption in terms of you know potential additional costs incurred, childcare, transport costs, um, and also the wider insecurity, you know, combined with not knowing how many shifts you might get in a month, uh, we can see how uh, this you know, this kind of uh, this conversation about hours and working practices begins to kind of shed light on uh, the nature of financial insecurity in in the UK labour market at the moment. Um, so there's workplace innovation on one hand, there's you know, the role of the government, um, but there's also kind of the bigger challenge, I think, of how we shift norms across our economy. Um, and that uh, has to do with control, like we were saying, but your workers having more control over what their working patterns look like, what that means for their, their wider lives, um, and an opportunity to kind of reset what our expectations are there. Um, but we also um, need to be thinking about um, you know, what this looks like in the, in the wider the wider policy context, given the amount of change we're going to be seeing uh, from everything from working time directives to the future of um, kind of low low wage sectors like hospitality, um, where we know, uh, you know there's major uh, major upheaval in, in in the months and years ahead uh, on the back of on the back of the pandemic, um, but also opportunities there to you know to create you know, new new and better norms for uh, to deliver financial security. Um, I'll touch quickly just on lone parents, which I know has, has come up. Um, I think that's a particularly acute challenge and, and uh, that really illuminates kind of why we need to be having this broader conversation about working hours as well. Um, some research we've been doing uh, has looked at not just um, basically lone parents in a range of work scenarios uh, and looking at kind of interactions with the social security system as well. Uh, and we can see basically lone parents need to be earning, you know, above the real living wage, really kind of, you know, quite significant hourly rates, uh, even if they're in full time hours of work. Uh, to be able to kind of uh, you know keep afloat to maintain a decent standard of living, uh, considering uh, you know the childcare costs that they're likely to incur through work, um, so I think that shows us too that this hours 
part of the picture is really, really critical. Um, those interactions between work and social security, um, particularly for second earners, looking at what those incentives look like uh, as you're looking to take on more hours. Uh, and that's particularly important at the moment. We saw, I think, uh, one of David's charts near the beginning of the presentation uh, really neatly showed um, that uh, if you look at um, uh, moving into work, um, uh, I, I think I, I've lost my thread for a second, uh, well, I'll come back to that point. Um, if we, if we invest um, in social infrastructure as well, looking more broadly uh, across the piece um, towards the expansion of free childcare, uh, towards transport to get people you know, connected to a, a wider range of jobs um, and to adult skills as well, um, looking at how people can progress uh, in work. Um, and those uh, interactions between uh, social security are a really critical part of that. Um, and then just some short reflections on a four day working week. Um, so I think we know this is a very popular policy um, you know, tied into a wellbeing economy agenda in Scotland already. Uh, but the question of how we get there and particularly which sectors uh, might be uh, kind of more suitable, less suitable. And there's really important challenges uh, uh, looking at that kind of wider uh, inequality across the labour market. Um, uh, about about how we get there and who we uh, you know, which sectors might be suitable, which sectors might be kind of left behind by this conversation. So, uh, although there's you know really critical challenges, particularly, particularly talking about um, the kind of gender dynamics of the labour market that I think we've also touched upon. Um, you know, beginning to boost the value attached to part time work, particularly to narrow that gap that we know that exists between uh, the kind of even the hourly earnings rates attached to part time work and equivalent full time work. We can see a shorter working norm as a really key critical uh, you know kind of mechanism to to narrow that gap. Um, I think we need to be looking at the kind of twin goals of, of uh, greater security across the labour market and particularly uh, for, for workers at the kind of sharp end, um, but kind of, you know, uh, setting those longer term ambitions on, uh, on, on well-being through shorter working time, uh, you know, kind of a, a kind of time approach to, um, to what we're looking for uh, from our, from our labour market and how it you know, provides a good life for more people. Um, and, uh, and you know, sectoral level collective bargaining uh, being a really critical way that we could begin to kind of iron out some of those or navigate some of that nuance, I guess, um, across different sectors, across different working norms, uh, you know, different kind of practical challenges around uh, how we get to um, you know, a future with, with greater security, but also you know, greater well-being for workers. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and so we've got some time for questions. Um, but thanks for a really excellent uh, discussion um, uh, and, and research to, to better inform the debate. Right, thank you very much, Rachel and, and Rebecca too. These are hugely helpful insights and, uh, and it'd be great, Rachel, if it's possible, once we put the slides and content on from today, if we can include your slides in as well, so people can see that and see about the work you're doing at IPPR Scotland as well, that'd be hugely, be hugely helpful. So we've got a bit of time for some questions. I see there's a couple of questions in already. And David, there's one particular question just for you, if I could just ask you just about uh, on a technical question, when we're talking about what hours worked here, and it's talking a lot about employee hours worked, um, just a definition about that, does that include self-employed, particularly uh, seeing the, the rise in uh, delivery drivers and things like that during the crisis? If you can maybe just answer that one quickly. So on the whole in our report, what we're looking at is employees. Um, we do have a bit of analysis there about the trend uh, in hours worked for the self-employed as well. Um, and certainly what you see among the self-employed, the, there's, there's been a really substantial fall in average hours worked of the self-employed, both for men and the, the decline in, in uh, average hours worked for self-employed men has been steeper than it has been for employees, which arguably slightly undermines um, my argument that the decline in hours worked for employees is partly around working time legislation uh, because that doesn't apply to the self-employed. So something else is happening with the self-employed. Hours worked for self-employed women is also declining. So there the trend for, for self-employed women is more in line with what's going on for men. And it sort of bucks the trend of what's going on for female employees whose average hours are increasing. So I, I think clearly part of this is there has been a there has been a rise in self-employment. Um, and there's a kind of debate around the extent to which you know this is is this push or is this pull? Is it people deciding they want to do to be self-employed? Um, or is it uh, to what extent does it reflect people sort of effectively getting pushed into self-employment because there aren't enough um, uh, 
opening employee uh, positions available. And certainly there's there's quite a bit of evidence that in, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, it was those push factors that were quite significant. And it was this sort of compositional shift towards some of that, um, uh, if you like, um, uh, what's self-employment on paper, but is effectively quasi um, in, in employment status that was causing that was leading to this big fall in average hours worked among uh, the self-employed. Um, so we do have to, we do have some of that uh, information in the report. Unfortunately, this the data on earnings for the self-employed is not very good, so we're not able to analyze in as much detail the the patterns of hours worked by uh, self-employment of different types. Okay. Okay, so um, one question that I'd like to pose to Rebecca and Rachel is around universal basic income. So we've sp spoken a bit about the four day working week, and that's obviously been something which has been, uh, a, a, again, a, a, it came to a, a prominence during the recent election campaign. But the other big thing in there, the big, the big idea was about universal basic income. And there's a lot about what that might have in terms of inequalities and the like, but just specifically in terms of of the labour market and working and how that might change. Um, what are your, what do you see as the potential opportunities and challenges? So maybe if I could come to you first, Rachel, and then and then you, Rebecca. Yeah, sure. I think um, an expanded conversation, you know, particularly in the back of the pandemic, sorry, I dropped my pen, um, uh, about uh, what role our welfare state plays uh, is, is definitely really welcome. Um, to me, I think the, the UBI debate um, obviously raises uh, a lot of questions that I think there's you know, a huge range of different views on and that definitely warrant more explanation around work incentives, um, around things like uh, the unpaid uh, work you know, that, that we are relying on, that we know is very, you know, very gendered in its distribution. Um, about what it would mean uh, for uh, for work incentives, particularly for second earners, um, and obviously that would rely, uh, I think, you know, to a huge extent on, on what level of a UBI payment we might be talking about. Um, we've done work uh, recently at IPR Scotland looking at a minimum income guarantee as a sort of alternative approach that I suppose um, could be a kind of gateway towards the UBI as a kind of further step if you wanted to. So a kind of um, uh, a social security system based on um, on adequacy as the kind of key key challenge um, and I think uh, where where I think this work uh, kind of illuminates that debate I think for me um, is that conversation around income adequacy um, and, and how you know a lack of hours means you know it, it, I think this definitely sheds light on um, on where people's incomes are obviously just too you know too low to support a decent standard of living um, and that's what I see as a kind of primary challenge and um, an UBI uh, might be part of how we get there um, but I know also we've done um some work uh, with uh, with people on this call with, with the Fraser Valentine Institute about um about how we might fiscally be able to support a UBI, um, and my concern there uh, certainly is um is about whether we could support uh, a social safety net that provides an adequate income for those who really rely on it. Um, people like you know lone parents uh, trying to get on in the labour market but facing you know really really severe headwinds in terms of costs. Um, so those are the kind of challenges that I'd be looking great. for. Okay, great, and um, and and Rebecca. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, Rachel's provided a really, really great answer to a tricky question there. And the work on the minimum income guarantee is certainly something that we really, really welcome in, in light of questions like this. Um, so to take a slightly different approach, I think the uh, the implications um, of universal universal basic income will certainly depend on how it's implemented. I know there are various different conversations around this at the moment. Um, but my hope that it would be that it would go beyond um, income and, and sort of uh, workforce regulation and so on, and where we get to see the benefits in things like mental health, improvements for the health service, um, and the sorts of slack that they're picking up um, through other perhaps deficiency that, deficiencies that we have in our welfare support that's available at the moment. Yeah, that's a, it's a really insightful comment. And I think that's the thing, it's defining what do we want to achieve from changing uh, the structure of society and the rewards to work, but also what we want to just have as a, as a core basic underpinning about, uh, about income levels across and all the various implications that has for health, well-being and, and sustainability more broadly. I'm conscious of time and that we've come to the end of, of the session today. As David said, the report will be going live on the Fraser Valander website in the next couple of hours and you can take a look at the report there. If you've got any questions, and pose it to the team uh, through the usual channels uh, with the Fraser.
Uh, can I, I guess the final thing for me to, to do today is really just thank, first of all, Standard Life Foundation for their support for this research and this, uh, the project that we've undertaken. And just also to thank Rebecca, Rachel, Robert and David for joining me on this session today and for the hugely informative session uh, that we've had. So um, last thing for me to do is to wish you the best of the rest of the day and bye for now.